All right, for the first song, we're going to sing one that I don't believe we need any words for. It's not in the hymnal. It's God Bless America. I believe we know that one. And if you don't, just join along, hum along. Let's all stand. We'll sing God Bless America. It's not in the hymnal. Here we go. God bless America. Seven, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. We'll sing the first verse and we'll go around and greet each other. Good morning, 437. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Go around and greet each other. Good morning. Good morning.
All right, let's grab those hymnals again. 437 on that second verse. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. Here we go. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His day is marching on. He has sounded forth a trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. While God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, while God is marching on. Well, amen, praise the Lord. I love those patriotic songs being sung in the house of God. Because we're meeting here today because of what was done for us by patriotic Americans and more about that as the day goes by but it is a beautiful day and when I pulled around the corner and I saw all of the flags in the yard and the beautiful grass cut it looked like Augusta Georgia at the Masters really looks beautiful and uh, brother Larry and his wife Karen and daughter Taylor put out those flags yesterday and uh, just it looks so nice just uh, I'm, I'm glad to be an Amer American I'm proud to be an American and, and I'm pleased and happy to be a part of Maple Grove Baptist Church and then you come in the auditorium I do believe uh, let's see Mich who did the flags in here I think Doug, and Sheila. Doug and Sheila and they do decorating for every occasion and everything is all red, white, and blue, and looks so good. Brother Craig Mode, you're the one. You're the Augusta groundskeeper, and yeah. And Miss Carla cleaned up the church. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be in the house of God. Brother Darwin, sir, would you ask the Lord to meet with us? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given us. Lord, as we remember the lives of ours, men, women, that has spent their lives and time to give us this privilege of being here tonight, Lord, to have this morning. Father, we pray to bless, bless each one, Lord, and currently in that purpose today, Lord, we pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. We'll go ahead and do another song. As you remain seated there, 438 is my country, tis of thee. 438 there in your hymnal. We'll sing all four verses. My 
My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and temple hills. My heart with rapture thrills like that above. Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our Father's God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, pray God our King. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. Lord, we do ask you to meet with us and bless this offering to your house and your work. In Jesus' name, amen. is it? I Love America. It's a beautiful song, and so maybe she'll play it again as we do the Penny March. I don't know that many of us know that one. We'll do the Penny March now.
for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. If you know the last one, help me out. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleamed, undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Brother Joe, the part of that song that we need to take to heart is that God shed his grace on thee. What would we be? What would we be, where would we be without the grace of God? Praise the Lord. Amen. So before we dismiss Junior Church, we have a, um, a presentation for Memorial Day. Do we have... Okay, I don't know what this means. That means in front of SOS. Okay, yes. Who? Thank you. All right, Robert, come on down. And I guess you're going to have something for your anniversary. Yes, when the wife, wifey comes back, which um, next Sunday is our special, our 39th, 39th special next Sunday. But she won't be here till the following Tuesday. So uh, you have to wait a couple weeks. Marco's birthday Friday. Get down here, Marco. Come on down. All right. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, so how old? 24? Marco? 18. Wow, awesome. All right, so we'll give two for one here. All right. Happy birthday to the both. Here we go. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you.
right, anything anybody like to say? Robert? <laughs> yeah. yep. Marco? No. All right, let's give a big hand. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So we have um, some families traveling for different reasons, um, but we're glad that you're here today and you're in for a treat. God sent us a man last week who came to visit our church, and then I found out how much he loves this country, how patriotic he is, and how much he loves the World War II veterans. And he is a history uh, person, and he has interviewed many, many, many World War II veterans. And he still keeps up with them, some over 100 years old. And uh, so this is... Uh, Larry loves to honor them. And what better day to honor our veterans, and especially those of the World War II era. Um, but anyway, Larry is going to present to us our Memorial Day tribute. So this is Larry Martin. We're glad to have him at Maple Grove Baptist Church. Let's give him a, a welcome. And then... When he's finished, then the kids could be dismissed for junior church. Um, my name is Larry Martin. I'm uh, brand new to your church, and I'd like to thank the church, and particularly Pastor Lang, for welcoming me so warmly. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I am not a certified collegiate historian. I'm a junkie. I have read nothing but World War II since I was probably 15 or 20. And then about 20 years ago, I started to interview these fellows and ladies for no other reason than my own knowledge. And um, about seven years into it, in about 2007, one of the mar Marines from Iwo Jima said, you know, Larry, you need to share these. And at the time, I had about 25, and I didn't know how to go about sharing them. I've always liked libraries, so I went to my local library. and. Um, I've now put on about 160 presentations at libraries, mostly in Michigan, a few in Florida, and a couple in Tennessee. Um, I just uh, want to thank all veterans. Do we have veterans in the audience? I am a Navy veteran, the only one. Another veteran? Mike? So I always, always want to thank all veterans. My little niche in history is World War II veterans, but all veterans. Um, I'm going to give you a little, uh, this is for Memorial Day, and for us older folks, it used to be called Decoration Day. Do you remember when it was called Decoration Day? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to give you a little chronological order of World War II. Um, prior to the beginning of World War II, we were, we were a very divided nation. Uh, we had what we called interventionists, and we had uh, isolationists. And the isolationists would have been led by a man named Charles Lindbergh, who had just flown in the Atlantic in 1927. Uh, he was very outspoken. He'd been to Germany. He knew they were very powerful. Germany had really, really rearmed. And we were about the number 19th size military in the world. We were absolutely nothing. Um, when you get a certain political party in office, uh, they will ignore the military. I'll go no further than that, historically. Um, <laughs> so uh, we were very... Uh, Fragmented. Uh, they were called interventionists and uh, isolationists, and they were very violent towards each other. Uh, the war actually started September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. About three days later, England and France declared war on Germany. We were still neutral. We remained neutral, although we were very neutral, but sending uh, war implements uh, to England and Russia. Uh, when we were attacked uh, December 7th, 1941, at Pearl Harbor, we lost about 2,500 primarily sailors, a few Marines, a few civilians, but primarily sailors when we were attacked. Uh, the, three days later, Germany and Japan, Japan attacked us and they declared war then, but Germany declared war on us December 11th, 1941. Uh, <clears throat> Germany and Japan in the year of 1942 was an extremely dark period for America. Um, we were just being not just we, the Allies. France had fallen in a matter of two weeks. Uh, we were totally unprepared for what was coming at us. 
Um, it was just a very black year. We did have our first three offensive um, undertakings. We had at New Guinea, and this was all in the summer of 1942, New Guinea. Um, Midway was an overwhelming victory for us. And then also Guadalcanal, which took six months, but was also a victory for us. So was New Guinea, but it took a lot longer. Um, By 1943, we had finally started to uh, get our industrial might going. We were a very powerful nation, military, not militarily, um, industrially, but it took us time to get moving. Uh, Roosevelt had tried to get us going in 39, 40, um, but we were so strongly isolationist that he, he couldn't, couldn't get the population behind him. Pearl Harbor stopped all that overnight. Isolationism was shunned. We were interventionists all the way by then, but we had been attacked. Um, in 43, uh, Joseph Stalin wanted a second front. Uh, we were the only nation in World War II to fight a two-front war. Um, just to give you some idea of the suffering inflicted upon Russia, I've interviewed a Russian soldier named, uh, can't think of it now, 15 years ago. He was at the Battle of Leningrad. It was a siege. Uh, of Leningrad, and you read about sieges in the Bible a lot in the Old Bible, Old, Old Testament. There was more loss of life in Leningrad alone than America, England, Australia, and, and Canada suffered in the entire war. About a million people died in that battle alone. Russia lost 20 million people. We lost 400,000. I'm not minimizing our 400,000 kids. I say kids, young men primarily, that died. I'm not minimizing that. I'm just trying to put it in perspective um, what kind of suffering World War II brought on. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to show you pictures of individual soldiers and describe some of their um, PTSD. At the time, they never heard the word. They called it shell shock, um, insanity, battle fatigue, but now it's called PTSD. All the same thing in any military. As back as far as there's been men fighting men, there's been PTSD. They just didn't use that term. Um, the Allies did invade France, Normandy, France. That would be June 6, 1944. It's called D-Day. Uh, D-Day, there was hundreds of D-Days. Anytime men were debarking from a ship to go to shore, it's a D-Day. But if you ask most people, they would say D-Day is December, or excuse me, June 6, 1944. That's the day that England and America landed on the French uh, coast uh, at Normandy. Um, in 1945, VE Day was August 8th. That was victory over Europe. And then VJ Day is uh, September 2nd. And everybody says in America, we threw two bombs, we dropped two bombs, and the war finally ended. That's true and not true. They also had, I think it was called the Potsdam Ultimatum, I believe, where they had decided Russia and Japan had fought a vicious war in 05, and Japan won. Uh, so they were natural enemies. Well, Stalin literally the day the first atomic bomb was dropped, August 6, invaded Japan from, the, from Japan's west. And so there was a million mad Russians also, as well as our two bombs, because we had done more destruction with incendiary bombs as far as loss of life and loss of property than the two atomic bombs. But all you'll hear in history is the two atomic bombs were dropped, Japan capitulated. That's not totally, that's not all of the story. So what I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about, just for a couple minutes, is what these, what these men went through. And I'm going to show you some pictures just to show you, again, I'm, I'm repeating, what these men went through for us. Me, 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 me. It sounds selfish, but think of it. You, 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 these young people, this baby that's here. We would have none of our freedoms if particularly World War II. I'm a Vietnam era vet. I didn't go to Vietnam. It didn't do anything but upset hippies. World War II changed the world. If you look at what Japan did to Korea and to China, it was barbaric. And we all know, many of us know what Germany did to Poland and to Russia and to Czechoslovakia and the Jews, homosexuals, uh, Jehovah Witnesses. It was barbaric. They would have done it to us if the World War II generation hadn't stood up. Both the men with the arms, the men and women in America that are producing the arms, uh, 
it was just a terrible fight. There were 16 million men in arms in about uh, September of 45. When I started doing my interviews, there were about four and a half million. There's a little less than 300,000 is the figure I hear most of the time now. The youngest is 95. I have two friends. I see one all the time. It's uh, just turned 100. He was at Pearl Harbor. Another is a 104-year-old lady that was a nurse in Australia, and I, I talk to her a lot. Um, she's very healthy, although she just had a, a miniature stroke. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some pictures. I can pass them around or probably don't have time. This man is Francis Angier. He was a B-17 B pilot. He made about 30 missions when he got shot down. Just to talk about suffering, this man's plane went vertical. And it was on fire, but the fire didn't get him, but the heat got him, burned his throat and nose terribly, and blew him out the window. They had no training in parachute use. They had a parachute. As he got blown out the window, the plane was dropping at the same exact time as he was, right next to him. He couldn't open his chute. Finally, he knew there was a cloud level at about 2,000 feet, and he opened his chute. He landed so hard, his head slammed the ground, his shoulders slammed the ground, his knees come out of joint, his neck hurt him to the day he died at 93 or 94. Another part of his body come out of his body. The tremendous force of hitting that ground. He suffered every day. Here's another friend of mine. I knew him a very short time. He was what was called a Marine Raider. They would today be called Marine Recon. They're very bad men. When I say bad in a complimentary sense. He was a Marine Raider. He was the most handsome. He was about 78. Tall, trim, handsome, wore, if, if any of you are familiar with Lansing, there's a clothing store, it's probably been there 150 years, it's extremely expensive, called Kazachex. This man didn't make a lot of money, but he made a living. He was so filthy from 1942 to 1945, clothes falling off him in these jungles, 105 degrees humidity. He swore he'd never be dirty. He never cursed. He was a constant gentleman. Here's where the PTSD kicked in. I interviewed him, and every other word was a curse. Them no good, you fill in the blank, Japs. Uh, and this was 55 years after it was over. So PTSD, even though you wouldn't have known it had you just met him. Here's a man right here. These are three brothers and a brother-in-law. This is the man I knew. His name is Bill Gilton. He was in the Marine Corps. He was in the Marine Corps. He fought at... Uh, Saipan, Tenin, and Tarawa, or Bishio, but Tarawa is what most people know it as. He came home, he worked, but he drank. He sat in front of a fire every night for 50 years, his family said. I knew him for about six or seven years. He sat in front of that fire and just drank. And it, he got in fights. Uh, he just had a terrible, he lost his wife, PTSD again, didn't know the term. Uh, he never spoke to anybody about it until 1994, which was 40 or 50 years later, when he happened to go back to um, Camp Lejeune or uh, Fort Camp Lejeune, and he got talking to some people. Uh, another thing is, I've, I've, I've spoke to a guy named Clyde Schofield who was at Pearl Harbor. You can't see this picture. This is the West Virginia. This water. I've talked to a guy named uh, can't think of his name. He was on a ship at Pearl Harbor. He was in the water in a whaleboat picking up burned and dead sailors for a week and taking supplies to the ships like the Oklahoma that was turned keel up. He said this oil was 10 to 12 inches thick and burning. Now, Clyde Schofield was over here in the Army about a mile away, and he could watch these sailors swimming in this. In 2008, he sobbed. He sobbed at what he saw in 1941, PTSD, suffering emotionally. Um, this is the same picture. This is the Marine I knew, Bill Gilton, with his brothers. Now, people call the Germans Nazis. That would be like calling everybody in World War II in America a Democrat. The Nazis were a political party. Some of the German soldiers were certainly Nazis, just the same as we would have had Republicans, Democrats, Independents. They don't like being called Nazis. Now, what they felt in 42, I don't know, but everyone I've interviewed, and I've interviewed many, they, they, they just said, don't call me a Nazi. There were Germans fighting for their country the same as we were. I've interviewed about five of them. This is a real close friend of mine. He died about five years ago, Ernst Floter. He was a photographer in, in Grand Ledge, just a fun man to be around. He, his words were, World War II ruined his life until he got here in the late 50s. 
And the funny thing about Ernst is he always wanted to come to America because in the 30s, as a little boy like these young fellows, he'd seen cowboy shows in the, in the West, Southwest. So we capture him in Normandy. He gets wounded about three times. We capture him, bring him back, and where do we send him? New Mexico and Arizona to pick fruit. <laughs> so he was in hog heaven. Uh, real quick, just to give you some idea, like right now you'll hear how police misuse this and we're so abusive to people. I just want to put a little historical perspective on America's magnanimity. That could be a wrong word, but our, uh, the way we treat people. If you were a prisoner of the Germans, if you're an American and you're a prisoner of the Germans, they didn't have much to give you because we'd been bombing them 24 hours a day since 43. And most of our guys got taken in 44 and 45 when we made ground invasion, although a lot of airmen were captured in 43 and 44. You were treated reasonably well. They just didn't have much to give you because we'd been bombing them 24 hours a day. If you were a prisoner of the Japanese, whole different ballgame. I've interviewed at least five or six. Uh, most of them got down to 85 or 90 pounds. They were beaten mercilessly. I've seen pictures of them, Japanese, doing uh, bayonet practice on live people. Uh, what the Japanese did, that's why it was, it was atrocious. And that's why to this day, I've asked, I went to paratroopers that fought the Germans. And I said, do you mind if I bring a German soldier in to one of my programs? And they said, no, I'll bring him in. I still bet to this day, if I could find a Japanese soldier, which you can't, because first of all, they died in mass. You could surround a thousand Germans and surround them. They were going to die. You'd see 2,000 hands come up. You could surround one Japanese all by himself, and he was going to make you kill him, or he was going to put a grenade under his arm. They were that fanatical. So anyway, the difference was Ernst Floater on film talks about being a prisoner of war he made 80 cents a day. 80 cents in 1945 was a lot of money. He could buy beer. He could buy chocolate. Get this. He could go on strike and did. Do you know what would happen if you'd have told a Japanese you were going to go on strike? I don't even want to go into it. It would have been horrific. So when we, when we hear about a terrible nation we are, that's a bunch of bunk. Have we made mistakes? Certainly. We're a great nation. This is proof of it right here, and I've got fellows on tape, this German soldier right here talking about it. So if you get a chance to meet a World War II vet and they're around, any vet, we owe everything, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, we owe everything to, to our veterans. But World War II in particular, it changed the world, folks, and it changed it for the better. Uh, I do library programs. If anybody's interested in World War II history, contact me. I'll let you know when and where. Um, just thank a veteran if you get to meet any, but particularly World War II, there's only 300,000 to young folks. That sounds like a big number, but I'm not a mathematician. It's a quarter of a million, so it's one 48th of what was here. There were 16 million. Would that be kind of right? Anyway, there's a very small percentage of them left there, 95 minimum. So if you get a chance to meet them, thank them. We owe them everything. Thanks, folks. You may be dismissed. The rest of us take our Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Very grateful for uh, someone who takes their history serious and honors people who deserve to be honored. What a blessing. Thank you very much. I typically have uh, a very thick file folder with a lot of uh, articles about Memorial Day and Memorial Day's history and I uh, read some of the articles each year, and I kind of rotate uh, different articles at different times. And I went to try to find my Memorial Day file folder recently, and it wasn't there. And it had never been gone. 
And so you know what God did? He didn't want me to go through that material. He sent Brother Larry. <laughs> That's what he did. That's the way God works. And I think I know what happened to it was I uh, was planning on creating my own black robe regiment curriculum and uh, lessons about fighting preachers, preachers who died at war, preachers who gave their lives, fighting side by side with the soldiers, especially as it relates to our battle for independence, our revolutionary war. And uh, so that's a whole different topic. And I've, I've dressed up as uh, Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, and he was a fighting well-known pastor from Virginia. Um, I love our history, and it's important. If you don't know your history, if you don't know where you came from, how do you know where you're going? And one of the things that communists do to take over a nation is they erase their history. So now you understand why uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa and rioting crowds have been tearing down monuments all over the nation. It's a very well plotted, uh, it's a plot we're under. And there is evil in the land. And they aim to bring this country to its knees in a communistic takeover. And they are, uh, unfortunately, the hour is late and their plans uh, have been in the works for a long time. And you could see, you could see how they're robbing the history. You can see how they're bringing in CRT and DEI, and they're bringing in uh, all of this insane philosophies to replace what we've always known as a nation. They're ripping our history away from us, so and they're allowing the our nation to be flooded. Some people say as many as 15 million will come across the border this year. Um, they say by time Joe Biden is out of office, America will be 20% illegal people who snuck into our country. 20 per how, how can we survive? Do you lock your doors at night? How many of you lock your doors at night? Some of you lock your doors during the day. You know, it's just prudent. But we've thrown the door open and invited people to come in, and we don't know where they're coming from. We have no idea the bad actors that are in our land and in our country. So let's thank God for what we have and for the people who've paid a price. But I say that to say this before we get into our, our lesson here. I want to quote one of my favorite presidents, and his name is Ronald Reagan. And he said this, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in a bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. So when we think of the people who paid a dear price and stood for this country, it's incumbent upon everyone here to take the torch and to continue the fight because the fight's not over. Every generation has to fight for freedom. And I'm willing to do that. I trust that you are too. Well... When we think about uh, Memorial Day, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to talk about a memorial for Jesus. And there are several memorials for the Lord in Scripture. Two of them are the ordinances of the local church. Could you tell me, anyone tell me what are the Two things that Jesus commanded us, and we call them ordinances of the church. 
baptism and communion. And that doesn't, uh, that doesn't negate the Great Commission, telling everybody about Christ, soul winning, missions, uh, evangelizing the world. That is also what he told us to do. But there are two memorials that he, he gave to us. And one was to remember his death, and one was to remember his burial and resurrection. And I thank the Lord for that. So let's begin with the scripture uh, talking about uh, this memorial to the master of the Lord's Supper. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, and uh, why don't, you've been sitting a while. Why don't we stand for a moment? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. These are the Lord's Supper scriptures. The Lord's Supper scriptures. So that we remember the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read verse 23, and uh, I'll read down a few verses. You could join me, and let's go down to about verse 29. 23 through 29, 1 Corinthians 11. For I have received of the Lord that which all... Why don't you read with me if you have it there? For I have received of the Lord... That which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. That's that memorial. Remember me. Memorialize. Let's read verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you on this beautiful Lord's Day uh, with grateful hearts for all that you have done. We just pray that you take this message today and help us, Lord, on this Memorial Day weekend to remember our fallen soldiers, to remember those who have gone before, and to especially remember your death on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So this weekend we're celebrating Memorial Day, and it is officially a day to remember those that have fallen in battle. And when you think about that, you think about the fact that the price of freedom has always been a very high price. How many of you know somebody who died on the battlefield, any battlefield, maybe someone from your family, a friend? How many of you know people who died at war fighting for this country? Let me lower your hands. Uh, how many of you know somebody, they didn't die, but they were severely injured? How many of you know some injured people? I know some injured people. My son, Tim, uh, lost a leg in Iraq uh, fighting for this country. And the price of freedom is high. It always has been high. It's the ultimate sacrifice. People gave the last full measure of their devotion. We think of Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg during the Civil War. What a high price is paid. And we do well to take a moment and to remember it. Because a nation that will not respect and remember the blood that was shed so that we could stay free 
is a nation that has lost, it's lost its way, and we are unworthy of the price that was paid if we aren't willing to respect it. Amen? Amen. And so the price has always been high. Now, I understand Memorial Day was started and is still to this day to remember those fallen in battle. How many of you know people who have lost somebody in their family and they take the Memorial Day weekend and they remember their loved one? How many of you know that's true? How many of you know that people put flowers on graves? Uh, they go and they do that. Uh, without changing the true meaning of Memorial Day, being to remember our fallen soldiers, I do know that people who have lost loved ones uh, take this weekend very seriously. And I'm, I don't disrespect that at all. And I just wanted to read some names of people that we know either they're directly from our church or their family of our church. But these people we remember today. Rhea Abbott passed away in 2021. Joanne Hashley, longtime member here. Craig's mom. March 6, 2021. Uh, we remember our dear sister Dorothy Boyer, uh, recently gone to heaven. And I know that you family members are thinking of your loved ones today. We've recently said goodbye to Dave DeLong, longtime member of our church. Billy Patrick passed away in the last couple of years. Some of you don't know Billy Patrick. We sure know Brother Billy. He was a kind, generous, gregarious, a one of a kind with the Lord. Beautiful mother of two small children died of cancer, Holly Getty, member of our church, just passed. And then uh, we lost Jerry DeMoss in the last couple of years, longtime member here at Maple Grove. The pastor's wife uh, who preceded me, who had 30 long years here as a pastor's wife, organist, helped out, uh, faithful uh, partner to Dr. Howard Jenkins, but Myrna Jenkins passed away recently, longtime member of our church. And then uh, Jerry DeMoss, there's two Jerry DeMosses. There's Jerry, the father, who passed away, and then right after that, his daughter, Geraldine, passed away. Uh, is there anyone else that uh, connected to our church or connected to your family in the last two years passed away? Mamma just passed. Should have had that on there. And that was just last month, right? Just last month. Uh, Bonnie? My eldest daughter last year and two years before that, her son. My eldest son. Yeah. 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 Mean a lot to us. Anybody else want to mention somebody today? Uh, Joe? Yeah. Yes, a dear member of our church, two dear members Jane DeMoss, Bob and Maxine Friend. We've lost a lot of people out of our church in the last little while. Um, anybody else? Somebody near and dear that you remember? Well, <clears throat> I think we should take time out 
today, visit graves if you can. Um, <clears throat> take time tomorrow, think about our soldiers and uh, what freedom really is all about. Because I'm afraid we take too lightly the sacrifices that were made to give us the freedom that we have. We take too lightly the blessings bought with blood, blood on the battlefield. But I want to take the rest of my time and I want to remember the blood that my Savior shed for me and the death that he gave on Calvary. And the death of the Lord Jesus Christ also purchased freedom. The freedom that we have from fear, the freedom from hell, and the freedom of knowing that we have eternal life. That was all paid for by blood. The blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us not forget him in his house on this day we call the Lord's Day. Let us remember our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's consider some memorials to the Master. The first memorial is the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper. It is a memorial of His death. That's what the passage is talking about. There's a lot of misunderstandings about what the communion table or the Lord's Supper table is all about. Some people believe that by taking communion, you get saved. That it is a, if you take communion, you're becoming a Christian. You do not become a Christian by the memorial of the Lord's Supper. So that is not a true uh, statement. You don't get saved because you had communion. Some people think that communion was only for the early church. He said, remember me till I come. All right? And so we're to remember until he comes again. That means our generation. It's not just for the early church. Some people think that communion takes away sin. It does not take away sin. And some people actually offer up the body of Christ every time they do a Mass. That is sacrilegious. And, and I learned this as a young man. It's called the doctrine of transubstantiation, where the priest, through his prayer, lifts up this piece of bread, and then he breaks the body of Christ again. And in their prayer... And in the Mass, they believe that they call Christ from heaven. Every time they have a Mass, they call Christ out of heaven, and they break him again. They break him every time they have a Mass. That's not Bible. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number 6 says it's impossible for Jesus to die and be broken again. But some people believe that he actually comes from heaven and comes into that piece of bread. There's nothing in the Bible that even comes close to teaching that. But it's what some people teach. And those are misunderstandings about the Lord's table. What the Lord's table was always meant to be was to be a picture of his broken body and his shed blood because he knew we'd be busy. How many of you get busy and forget to do things? How many of you miss uh, major appointments or, or you miss somebody's special day because you got busy? You forgot some things. Jesus knew that we would be busy people and that long after he's gone, we would forget about him. Unless in the church, we sat at the Lord's table on a regular basis, read this passage, and took time out of our busy lives to be still, to be quiet, to reflect, to remember that he died on the cross. His body was broken and his blood was shed. Communion is a memorial for the church. The things we learn by taking time 
to remember what Jesus did to purchase our salvation and our freedom, it tells us about the seriousness of our sin. Sin is very serious. So serious that it took God's Son coming to earth, born of a virgin, living a perfect sinless life, and dying on a cross for our sins. That's how serious sin is. It's also a reminder, and the things that we learn is the greatness of God's love. We see how bad our sin is, and we see how great is God's love. Every time we sit at the Lord's Supper table, we remember that God loves us. And I want to remind us here today how much God loves you. And when you know who you are, and you know what you are, and you know how flawed you are, and you know how sinful you can be, and you know how your attitude can be bad. You know how you can say things you ought not to say, think things you ought not to think, and do things you ought not to do. We all know that we are prone to sin. And yet God still loves us. That is uh, absolutely, uh, every time I think of what he did on the cross, I am reminded how much he loves this world. And I'm reminded the cost of my salvation, what it costs me. Take your Bible, turn over to Romans chapter number 6. And let's talk about the second memorial. Jesus said, don't forget that I died. And then he said that once we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, the church is supposed to baptize People that come to know Christ as Savior. Baptism is an ordinance of the church. And it is a memorial of Christ's burial on the ground and his resurrection. So let's look at verse 3 and 4. Romans chapter number 6, verse 3 and 4. The Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And we remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So what is baptism? Why do you get baptized? Well, I'm going to read for you out of Matthew chapter number 3, verse 13. Matthew 3 and verse number 13 through 17. We see the fact that Jesus got baptized. And when I get baptized, and when I was baptized back in 1979 in Seattle, Washington, at the Great Tabernacle Baptist Church, I followed Jesus. And that's exactly what baptism is. It is being like Christ and following in his footsteps. He got baptized, and I got baptized, and many of you have been baptized by immersion under the water, back up out of the water. That is scriptural baptism. Look at verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And baptism, or baptized is a word, um, baptizo, which means immersion, which means all the way under the water. When you bury somebody who died, you bury them all the way under the ground, right? You don't leave half of the body out. You bury it all. And Jesus, by going all the way under the water, he was buried in the water. And that's what baptism is. It's immersion. It's all of you going into the water. That's biblical baptism. Look at verse number 14. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. 
And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So baptism, what we learn from that and what it is, it is doing what Jesus did. It is following in his steps. Not only that, it is obedience to his command. Look at Matthew 28. Very quickly, Matthew chapter number 28. Let's focus on the Great Commission. It is obeying the Lord. We're going to look at verse number 18, Matthew 28, verse number 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we were commanded in verse 20 to do these things. And part of those things was to baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It's obedience. Baptism means I am obedient to the Lord. And if you've not been baptized under the water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, according to Matthew 28, then we're not obedient. A Christian who's accepted Jesus' gift of eternal life and because of the blood your sins were forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. You need to step out and you need to, in public, you need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and be obedient to the command because the church was commanded to baptize people who've come to Jesus Christ. I appreciate uh, Brother Sean here on Easter Sunday declaring publicly his faith in Christ, telling us how he came to know the Lord. And then he found the church, and he wanted to be a part of us. And he wanted to identify. He wanted to obey. And he got baptized. What a wonderful thing when people obey the Lord. And we remember it's a memorial of the death the burial, and the resurrection, being raised to walk in newness of life. Have you been baptized? And if you are, and you did, how did you prepare your heart for baptism? I mean, in order to do something like that, your heart's got to be in the, in the right place with Christ. Your heart was in the right place. You wanted to be like Jesus. You wanted to do what he did. He got baptized in the Jordan River. Hey, I can do that. I want to be like him. I want to obey him and follow him. And it takes the heart being prepared to want to do the right thing by Jesus Christ. And how long ago was it that you got baptized? For me... 43 years ago, my heart was right with my Savior. And I wonder how many of us got baptized maybe years ago. Let me ask you, were you walking more closely to him then than you are now? Is it time for a new dedication? On Memorial Day weekend, as we remember the one who died for us, to set us free, to purchase our salvation, to give us the freedom from our sins, and should it be a wonderful time, it would be a wonderful time 
if we would rededicate ourselves to get back to that place where we were when we got baptized because our heart was obviously toward the Lord when we got baptized, right? Maybe we need to go back there. Maybe on Memorial Day weekend, we need a fresh dedication of our lives to the Lord. And last of all, go to 1 Peter chapter number 2. We'll wrap up with this. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Not only do we remember how Jesus died. Not only do we, we remember that he was buried and rose again, but we also remember the way he lived his life. And that is a memorial today in 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 21. And the scripture says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. We're supposed to remember him. We're supposed to remember how he walked. We're supposed to walk like him on this Memorial Day weekend. Let us remember the example of the Son of God who was willing to suffer for us, who was willing to die for us. He was willing to come to earth for us, to leave his home in heaven, to leave his heavenly Father, and to come here to be despised, to be hated, to be rejected, and to be crucified. What a wonderful thing if on this weekend we would remember the steps that he took while he was remember how he walked and if we would desire to be like him what a tremendous thing if I could rededicate myself if you could rededicate yourself if we could get a desire to walk like Jesus walked what's been one of the most successful campaigns or slogans of the last 15 or 20 years, WWJD, right? How many of you know what that means? What would Jesus do? That's a, maybe something that we should be asking ourselves. Uh, what did Jesus do and what would he do? And do you know a Christ-like life is a memorial to him? Because you need to be careful. Because you're the only Bible that many people will ever read. And if they know you're a Christian, if they know you go to church, they're going to be looking at your life to see for ways that line up for what they believe would be righteous living and caring and loving. And so this weekend... As we remember how Christ walked, may God help us to walk like Jesus walked as a memorial of his life. Because the Bible says here in verse number 21, he left us an example that we should follow his steps. And as we follow his steps, people will then see Jesus again in your life. And you know you may be the only Bible that anybody will ever read. And so, let every word, let every deed remind people of Jesus. Now, that's a tall order. But by the grace of God, if we yield ourselves to the Lord, we rededicate our hearts, and we ask Him to use our lives... We can make an impact in this city. We can reach people easier by our testimonies than by our words oftentimes. Because your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. How many of you ever heard that before? How we walk talks. And how you 
live your life without even saying a word is a testimony of your faith. May God use us to reach this city. May God use us to reach the people that we work with. May God use us to reach our neighbors. May God use us to, re to reach our family and our friends. So perhaps we could be rededicated this weekend as we remember what Jesus did on the cross, as we remember how he was buried and rose again, and as we remember on Memorial Day weekend how Jesus walked so that we could follow his steps. Would you bow your head for, uh, for, for a time of prayer? And why don't you just take a, a moment here and, and i got a question to consider as you heads are bowed, eyes are closed, you're thinking, what kind of a memorial to Christ are you? What kind of a testimony to the world have you been? How much, like Jesus, have you been? That is a good question. And so, there are many people in our world today that need to be set free. And it is the power of Christ to set people free. And it's imperative that we remember what he did and that we walk in his steps so that we can have an impact in our world. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder today... <clears throat> If you've taken time to remember what Jesus has done for you recently, have you stopped and thought about? Why don't you take the moment right now as the music is played, and why don't you just take a moment and think about the cross. Think about the blood that was shed for you. And tell Jesus you remember. Lord, I remember today. Ask the Lord for that, some, some grace today to walk like Jesus walked. And if you know in your heart there's been things very inconsistent with the way you've been acting lately that's not at all like Jesus, would you ask? Would you clear that air? Would you confess that to Him? Admit it. Say, Lord, I've not. I've been angry. I, I've been. I've been this. I've been that. I, I really haven't been much of an example of Christ in my home. Haven't been much of an example of Christ where I work, or among my friends and peers. Take a moment and just ask the Lord to help you to be a good example in this community. If you're here today and you need to make some sort of commitment to Christ, whether it's to be publicly baptized, whether it's to join the church, whether it is to Talk to people about the Lord. Be a witness. Whether it's just an overall in your heart, you know 
you haven't been as excited about the Lord as maybe that time you got baptized, you were so excited. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've drifted. Ask the Lord to help you come back. today and you have not accepted Christ if you have not confessed your sin to him and asked for forgiveness if you have not believed on him as your only hope for heaven if you have not accepted God's gift of eternal life you need to do that today you need to be saved if you're not saved you need to get saved you need to be born again let Jesus come into your heart and life I'll be glad to pray with you about that, show you from the Bible. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand. If there's anyone who would like to accept Christ, I'd love to talk to you about that. If anybody would like to make a decision for the Lord, you can come forward and let us know. Grab your hymnal and turn to number 413. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. We'll sing one verse. 413. Said. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.